So the title of the talk is directly uh, Hawkes processes with applications to clustering continuous time document streams. Thank you. In the last authorly song, um, my student cannot come for the presentation. Uh, I will present it instead. Um, so in this talk, we are going to basically look into um, clustering documents uh, as they arrive um, in a streaming fashion. So very often we can collect uh, all kinds of uh, news articles, blog data, tweet data. And this type of data not only has contents, it has a very precise timing information. So we want to leverage two sorts of information, both the contents and then the timing information to come up with better clustering of the document, extracting the topics, and also understanding the uh, temporal dynamics. So essentially, uh, based on this type of data, um, very often this type of uh, online documents, they are going to uh, cluster around some real life events. For instance, these are two uh, cluster of documents we extracted from the Spinner data set. One of these uh, clusters is about Cyclone Yassi in Australia. The second cluster is about uh, Batman Dark Knight. And then uh, these clusters, actually this cluster of documents actually arrive in time. If you look at their temporal dynamics, so one cluster, uh, this uh, Cyclone Yasi, is going to have uh, quite different, essentially very different temporal dynamics compared to these cluster of documents related to Batman. And then um, uh, this Cyclone Yasi is some disastrous events, and it arrives very quickly, and um, you know, the uh, intensity of these, um, or, the, or the popularity of these particular topics surge up very quickly and pick it uh, within a few days and quickly it, it, it just uh, dies down. But for this uh, another type of cluster about this movie, and then the, it, there's sort of trend, okay? The topic is getting more and more popular as time goes on. So they are very different, they have very different temporal dynamics where we would like to extract it from the data, okay? So the goal is uh, we have these uh, document stream arriving in time, and then we want to leverage two sources of information. First is text information. The second is the temporal uh, timestamps to uh, cluster this document, extract topic from these clusters, and learn these uh, potentially very different temporal dynamics for different clusters. And then um, um, for these uh, two topics, uh, clustering documents and learning temporal dynamics, um, for each one of these topics, people have adjusted separately. For instance, uh, one popular model for uh, clustering documents in machine learning is uh, using this so-called Dirichlet process, which can take into account potentially infinite number of clusters. It's some kind of prior on the number of clusters or prior on the way you partition the data. And this type of Dirichlet process consists usually two parameters. One is this uh, scalar alpha called concentration parameter. And then this G0 is some base measure where you sample these, uh, um, some representative parameter for each cluster. So essentially, uh, um, when, you, when you actually run these, uh, the uh, Dirichlet process for partition data, clustering data, um, you can sort of make an analogy to this Chinese restaurant process. Uh, essentially, uh, you have a few tables. For instance, here you have table one, table two. Each one is going to correspond to one cluster. And each table is going to have its associated parameter theta. So in this case, theta one, theta two. And then for the first table, you have uh, already got uh, five people uh, or five documents side to it. And then the second table, uh, theta two, uh, you have three documents side to it. And then uh, when the new document arrives, so uh, which cluster I should assign it to? So it's going to be assigned to, uh, uh, with a probability proportion to the number of documents already in a particular cluster. And then uh, there's always some small probability alpha that you will create a new cluster. So this way you allow you know, document to be clustered and potentially take into account the growth of the number of clusters. Okay. Um, when you have temporal data, uh, one very uh, straightforward uh, way to extend this idea to temporal data is actually partition your, your time into different epochs and run this Dirichlet process in different epochs. And uh, there also has been some efforts called the recurrent Chinese restaurant process, trying to take into account the temporal dependency between these uh, uh, clusters uh, across different blocks. Essentially, there's some uh, news uh, that is very popular, some, some events, uh, it's a hot topic, and then what's happened yesterday may tell you that the, uh, tomorrow the news is also about the same thing. So the way you incorporate this type of temporal memory or popularity of the topics is by uh, computing some uh, quantity called M. For each cluster K, 
okay, you will have some popularity score. Uh, and then uh, the popularity score of this cluster K at time t is going to be a weighted sum of the popularity of this topic in the past few days. And these weights is going to be some kind of discounting weights, okay? So if uh, lots of uh, you know document uh, it has been assigned to a particular cluster, it's a popular uh, it's a popular basically topic. It's likely that, that the next doc document is also coming from the same topic. And then when a new uh, document arrives, so you're going to assign this document to the, uh, these clusters, not just according to the number of documents already assigned to the cluster, also according to the popularity. You use the counts, the current counts plus the popularity. That's going to be the proportion of the probability assigning this document, okay? But uh, there's some drawbacks of this approach. The first drawback is uh, you need to choose the, the size of your epoch, whether it's uh, one day, one week, or one month. And some topic may be uh, changing very fast and then dies out very quickly. Some topics is, is a slower in time scale. You have to pick some time epoch, which is not easy to do in practice, okay? So, um, this is a, a very natural heuristic way of uh, incorporating temporal information into this clustering problem. So uh, what this paper, the Richard Hawks process, is about is a more uh, elegant way or simple way of incorporating this temporal information into this uh, document clustering uh, kind of uh, problem. So uh, in order to do that, we need to introduce this uh, concept called uh, condition intensity function. Essentially, we are not going to discretize your time and divide these time into uh, epochs anymore. We're going to model this uh, interval between the arrival of two uh, document, online document, as some kind of random variable. We're going to model that random variable. So uh, this random variable is just a one-dimensional continuous random variable, okay? It has its density f, conditional density f. It has its corresponding cumulative density function. You also have the so-called so survival probability, okay? So these uh, density is actually not an easy quantity to manipulate. And uh, what we are going to do is to uh, introduce uh, a much more convenient con uh, quantity called the condition intensity function. It is just the ratio between the density and the survival function. Okay? It's related to the density. And if you have the condition intensity, you can recover um, the density via these following relationship. Just the condition intensity multiplied by the survival function, it's going to give you the uh, density, okay? Condition intensity, you can also think about these the, as an instantaneous uh, probability of something happened given the history, okay? So with this condition intensity, uh, we are going to uh, uh, parameterize this and use it to model these temporal dynamics. There are many uh, ways to uh, parameterize lambda, this condition intensity function, but some you might be already familiar with. For instance, uh, if you assume that the, the arrival of the document is, uh, the arrival time is independent of each other, so you get Poisson process, which has been already used for modeling, you know, people queuing for some service. And then in general, you can just have some condition intensity function, which is changing over time, just lambda t, and in this particular paper, we use this uh, Hawks process. It's a very special way of parameterizing this condition intensity function. Essentially, it has a constant lambda uh, zero, which is just some baseline uh, activity like uh, Poisson process. You also have an additional term, which is going to uh, incorporate a historical event in, in this intensity. So essentially, you have a summation over all events happened in the past. Um, if that event, if there's an event ha in the past, you're going to add the function, uh, gamma t, okay, into your condition intensity function. And then I'm going to show you an example for this gamma t, uh, why is it good for uh, modeling, you know, uh, and show you why is it good for modeling self-excitation and the hotness of the topic, or popularity of the topic. So this is an example uh, where we actually choose the gamma t function, gamma function to be exponential, the difference between your current time of interest and this T, T, I, the, the time of the event happened in the past, okay? The function, uh, it's just an exponential function. So if you have a lot of these uh, exponential functions, you sum them together, you're going to boost this intensity, okay? Um, if there's some, uh, quite a big interval between these events, uh, when you sum them together, the intensity is going to be small. So essentially, if something happened in a re recent past, and lots of uh, events about the same particular topic or cluster, then the intensity of that cluster is going to be high, okay? 
So you capture some kind of self-excitation. And as time goes by, there's no event happen, the intensity dies out to, to zero again. Okay. So um, this is the way you parameterize the um, essentially the temporal information. We're going to make use of this conditional intensity function to control the assignment of document to the cluster. And, right? And uh, essentially, this is a dirichlet Hox process. It's going to consist of two parts. The first part is still this dirichlet process. Allows you to uh, generate new clusters and assign the old document, uh, assign document to existing clusters. But we are going to control these, uh, uh, the assignment of these uh, document clusters using temporal information instead of just the size of the cluster. Okay? Um, overall, it looks like this. It's like extending the uh, Dirichlet process with the additional axis, which is the temporal axis. So you are going to have uh, many clusters. For instance, cluster one has a corresponding parameter, cluster parameter theta one. It can be the mean of the cluster, or it can be the, uh, the representative topics of the cluster. And then you have theta two, and each cluster is going to have a timeline associated with it. Okay? There will be documents assigned to that particular cluster, and those documents have their own time points. Uh, these documents happening in, within a particular cluster is going to define intensity function, condition intensity function lambda, uh, theta i here, okay? And then uh, when a new document arrives, and then you need to decide which cluster you assign this document to. So uh, you assign the document to a cluster proportional to the condition intensity instead of the counts. Okay, you assign it proportional to the condition intensity. So if that condition intensity is high, it's more likely the document is going to assign to it. And then you always preserve some small uh, Poisson uh, zero, lambda zero, okay, baseline intensity for creating new cluster, allowing for new topics uh, emerging in, in the document stream. Okay. So this is the uh, sort of key idea or high level idea of this uh, the ratio Hox process. It's really just using uh, the condition intensity function to control the creation of new cluster and the assignment of document to new cluster. Yeah? It's a generative model that you can also simulate uh, documents and the arrival times of the document from this model. So uh, the generative process is something like this. It can be right on just in one uh, page. And essentially, uh, you need to generate both the timing information and also some cluster parameter from this model. Um, so the first document is going to be a sample from this uh, baseline intensity lambda zero, sample from Poisson, that's the first, uh, the arrival time on the first document. And then um, the, the arrival time, then for the next document, the arrival time is going to sample according to the overall you know, uh, activity of the entire document stream. So that's going to be lambda zero plus everything uh, happened in the past. Um, once you sample this new document, the second document, then you are going to decide which cluster you're going to assign to it. You're assigning to it according to this uh, the corresponding, uh, proportional to the corresponding condition intensity. And for if a new cluster is being created, you also need to sample the corresponding uh, cluster parameter theta here, okay? Sample from the base intensity, G0. Otherwise, you just use the um, uh, same parameter as the existing cluster. So uh, this is the uh, Dirichlet process, Hox process, and then depending on how you actually choose your G0, how complicated G0 you want to use, you can use it for document clustering, uh, you can use it for other type of clustering as well. So essentially, if you want to use it for document clustering, you just specify, uh, you just specialize your G0 to the model that is uh, interesting for uh, uh, document clustering. So essentially, the only change you make is uh, once you sample this parameter from, uh, for, for a cluster, it's sampled from some Dirichlet process. It's a distribution over the vocabularies, yeah? And then for each word in the document, you're gonna going to sample according to that topic vector, okay? And that's it. And we also have this additional parameter, alpha, I'm going to explain in the next slides, which allows you to also learn the uh, kernel function, trigger kernel function, rather than just restrict it to one of these uh, um, exponential kind of function. So uh, essentially you can do is um, you use some basis function and then the trigger and kernel is going to be the weighty sum of this uh, uh, basis function. And these uh, weights alpha um, is also going to sample from the same process, okay? 
So uh, I'm not going to go into the details of the inference, but the, the high level idea is when your document arrives in time, we have this uh, probabilistic generated model, we can actually infer the parameter um, using uh, just sequential Monte Carlo. Yeah, essentially you draw lots of samples, and, um, and every step when a new uh, document arrives, you need to resample the cluster uh, membership of that. You also want to update the uh, trigger and kernel for that particular cluster, and then you also update the weights for a particular uh, particle. In the end, when you want to do inference, you can either uh, pick the uh, particle with the highest weights and then uh, using that as your cluster parameter. Okay, um, this is basically the model and then the inference. In terms of uh, experiments, uh, we have conducted both uh, synthetic experiments and uh, real data experiment and spinner data. And uh, in the synthetic data experiment, uh, what this figure is showing is uh, um, how well you can recover the, this trigger and kernel, okay? Uh, in this, uh, the leftmost panel is a trigger and kernel. Essentially, the x-axis is time, and the y-axis is intensity. It's uh, so, so artificial that, that what this figure means is uh, um, you have several typical peaks of triggering. Something happened, some article in the same cluster happened, and then maybe in around somewhere around 3.5 uh, hour, there's another event happen. Uh, maybe uh, around six, there's another event happen, okay? It encodes some periodicity in the data. So uh, as you um, apply this uh, particle filtering approach, you can actually recover this uh, uh, trigger and kernel uh, uh, very well, okay? So um, a question is, uh, uh, when you do this uh, clustering using both the content information and then temporal information, um, is it going to be helpful for each other? If you just do this uh, clustering based on content alone, or using some heuristic approach, uh, partition this temporal information into epochs, uh, would you do just as well? Uh, the answer is uh, if you do it using the visual Hox process, you can maximize your usage of both type of information. So these are two examples. The first example is uh, we have some synthetic data with the two clusters, and then blue cluster and red cluster. Uh, what is plotting in the leftmost panel is the intensity of the two clusters. These two clusters have no activity uh, overlapping in time, okay? So temporal information is not, not that, it's, uh, is, uh, is uh, sort of, uh, they're separated. And then uh, what we are doing is uh, we're going to uh, make the, this topic within this two cluster um, overlapping, make this topic similar, okay? If you make the topic similar between the two clusters, it's more difficult. So essentially, uh, we are increasing the difficult level in, in the second panel of this clustering problem. And then as you uh, increase the overlapping uh, between the two clusters, it's going to uh, give you worse and worse results, yeah. And then, um, so uh, we are getting, doing better than this recurrent Chinese uh, restaurant process. And uh, for another more difficult case, when we have uh, essentially interleaving temporal dynamics, we're also doing much better. So besides um, uh, synthetic experiment, I'm just going to quickly go through the real world experiment. Uh, we use uh, one million documents from Spinner data set. And then the vocabulary of these uh, topics is going to consist of uh, uh, 100K uh, words. So essentially, uh, these are the topic uh, uh, I ha we have ex extracted from this uh, uh, document stream. You can see some meaningful topics such as uh, task and shooting and Dark Knight movie and then this uh, cyclone and also NASA space launch, things like this. And for different type of topic, you, you learn very different uh, trigger and kernel and different type of topic also have very, uh, very distinct temporal dynamics. And this is the sort of the information extract from these uh, a document stream using the visual Hox process. Um, again, uh, you can use this approach for predicting the arrival of future events, and it's pretty accurate. And uh, in terms of scalability, it's also very fast. It only takes 0 0.3 seconds to process one document, even you are having, you have already processed like uh, uh, one million documents. So I'd like to uh, end this talk by just uh, quickly summarizing uh, the original Hox process is sort of combined this temporal prime process and Bayesian non-prime matrix. It's sort of an unexplored area, largely unexplored area. It, it basically combine both temporal information and then uh, content information very nicely. So there are many, many generalizations you can make using this uh, the usual Hox process type of uh, framework. 
uh, to combine temporal information and uh, other information. For instance, uh, you can incorporate spatial information. You can have a spatial intensity, and you can do topic modeling with the spatial info, uh, um, and temporal information. You can also combine these uh, Hox process and temporal prime process with other Bayesian non-parametric approach for feature extraction. For instance, the Indian profile process and uh, maybe something hierarchical topic model as well. Okay, uh, that's what I want to say about this uh, duration Hox process. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So we have time for uh, one question. Yes, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, it's very interesting work. Um, so my question is: Is this uh, Dirichlet Hox process stationary? Because um, based on your um, 14th slide, your generator model, mm -hmm. um, it's quite different from the traditional um, simulation method of a Hox process. Because usually, after you're generali uh, mm -hmm. generating the candidates, yeah. there will be a thinning process afterward. Mm -hmm. And in your model, it seems there, I there is no thinning process. So, um, so actually, there's one parameter in this Hox process controlling the stability or, uh, or stationarity of the process. So the parameter is going to be actually uh, this alpha, alpha parameter in the Hox process. Right. So if you can control alpha to be something smaller than one, uh, your process is going to be stationary. It's not going to explode with infinite number of events. Okay. So you will see that uh, if you make alpha smaller than one, what you will see is sometimes there's some burst activity, some popular topic comes, but after a while it dies out. You won't see just infinite number of events. We carefully control this, then you, you won't actually have this style problem. A uh, second qu uh, thing is uh, uh, we don't just model temporal information. There's some uh, content information. Actually, the content information also helps sometimes drive down the uh, the intensity because uh, you don't see any document with the same topic. The intensity is going down. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. So we do not have qu uh, time for more questions. So thanks for attending. Let's conclude the session. Thank you.